In their book, 101 Pataphysical Words, the Collège de Pataphysique reprises the aesthetic system of the Ulipo writers, turning a method of artificial constraints into a general pataphysical posture. They call it Uexpo, X referring to the mathematical variable which stands in for an unknown. The Collège writes, Uexpo is a generalization of the concept of the Ulipo. U signifies to open, Uhua. Po is for potential. X, in each distinct case, signifies the domain of activity designated by the first syllable of the word. In the book, they give several examples. Uhispo for history. Ufopo for photography. Upolpo for politics. <laughs> or in the concept of this paper, uspepo, an opening to speculative potential. I also think of it as a theory full of holes. This is not a James Terrell, <laughs> but it might as well be. <laughs> it's not really a sky space. Terrell's rooms where one goes to sit and look up at the sky as much as it is the default state of technological living. In this, James Terrell is the visual companion to John Cage, and whatever light happens to be around can itself be attributed with visual agency and intentional presence. The instrumentalization of the conditions of vision, which says nothing yet about what it is that conditioned vision happens to actually see. The observation of perceptual conditions might be the more important contribution to speculative thinking, but the particularities of what appears to the gaze is the lived condition of conditions. It often forms an exception. Part one. So I was going to do something that I don't usually do in this paper, which is make an argument. <laughs> but then I realized that I don't actually enjoy making arguments. So I changed my mind, and I decided that I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Ironically, that was sort of the point of the argument in the first place. So in some ways, the fact that I changed my mind means that the argument happens to have already been made, even though I didn't make it yet, and I actually still plan not to. <laughs> but what I was going to argue, which I'm not anymore, is that pataphysics is first non-philosophy. The first phase of the argument involved asking after Graham Harmon's formulation of aesthetics as first philosophy, and in particular, wondering where he gets his version of aesthetics, which seems strangely divorced from any kind of contemporary aesthetic theory that I've encountered. I mean, I have no trouble with his definition of philosophy, but to be honest, I learned aesthetic thinking by looking at paintings and installation art, not, my, not by meditating on books by Immanuel Kant. And I'm thinking here, of the rich history of 20th and 21st century aesthetics, from Dada and Fluxus to relational aesthetics and art as social practice. But then, at the same time, Kant's theory of aesthetics was paradoxical and may be more relevant here than I want to give it credit for, Anchor, anchored as it happened to be in the intentional embodiment of disinterested thought, artificial boredom. Harman might argue that such a position is foundational but what I learned from looking at painting is that boredom can be simulated and thus stimulated. By this I mean that one can put it on, adopt the posture, so to speak. And to make this observation is to suggest that the simulation of boredom for Kant and for me is an instrumentalist provocation. It has nothing yet to do with allure and everything to do with adopting a position and sitting there and waiting. At a certain point, boredom takes over and one begins to notice things that weren't there before. And to take back part of my disagreement, which I can do because I'm not making an argument, <laughs> I suppose it's possible that the emergence of relational stimulus out of the spirit of boredom could be thought of as a form of allure, bored into existence. Or maybe it's more like an invitation. Or maybe it's even like hunting for allure, looking for the ways to enter into composition, be affected, feel, relate, or maybe it's all of these, even though that doesn't quite make sense. It could also probably be seen as a technological position, but not quite what Harman and Heidegger and other thinkers of technology prescribe as the way a tool reveals its essence only when broken. Aesthetics, for me, is just the opposite of such a search for essences. Aesthetics is more like waiting for a tool to become self-conscious. It's more like how Amanda Butskis describes technological encounter as relational, 
potentially ethical, maybe even vulnerable. I say, I say vulnerable because it strikes me that to say a broken tool reveals its essence is actually quite mean-spirited. To say that a broken tool is vulnerable and presents an opportunity for empathy is better. <clears throat> but what do I mean by mean? Certainly not a prohibition against treating things as tools, but maybe, since in some ways, the mere possibility of a mode of thought that treats anything as a tool is potentially problematic. Instrumentalization rather than relationality. And what's interesting to me is that this actually isn't anthropomorphism, even though it sounds like it. Instead, it's that form of aesthetic theory that acknowledges that media and technologies are not neutral, have predilections, and thus, in a certain manner of speaking, habits, and even personalities. And why couldn't one sympathize with a broken tool, adopting a relational posture rather than one of disinterest? And why couldn't looking at a painting or a video projection be understood as an exercise in vulnerability, a place where no signal becomes a sky space? Now I've broken here with the argument I wasn't going to make and found myself making a different argument, perhaps sympathizing with how my initial thoughts were already full of holes. It would take more work to patch up the argument than I think it's worth, but it takes no work at all to let it be a series of vulnerable ideas. In fact, in many ways, the ideas might even have more possibilities that way, even if the condition of such a position is that the argument remained broken. The first proposition, then, that I'm not going to make is that aesthetics is a capacity to sympathize with vulnerability, ou volpo, an opening to the speculative potential of vulnerability. When one stares at a solid field of color for long enough, a flicker begins to form within the apparatus of vision. Technically, it's called the Gansfeld field, and it's a nascent, if inverted, form of pareidolia. Here we are not so much seeing patterns in the noise, but seeing noise itself, where none is technically present. Something similar happens when we enter a dark room. The eyes, struggling to see anything at all, create patterns of flickering lights. The paradox is that these flickers actually punctuate the otherwise homogeneous field of color or of darkness poking holes in the uniform surface. The holes, however, come from the mind, from overstimulated retinas that insist on noise as the default status of vision before it appears. Part two. Since we've established that the argument I'm not going to make is already full of holes, I suppose I can share the second part of what it would have been, but isn't which involved a claim that aesthetics, insofar as I'm looking at aesthetics as a gesture rather than analysis of material objects, actually seems to have more in common with Francois Laruelle's concept of non-philosophy than with philosophy proper. Specifically thinking about Laruelle's insistence that the destiny of non-philosophy is to exit the constraints of thought and to become a form of philosophical performance. Now I realize that I'm misreading Laruelle by claiming that he's making an aesthetic argument but I'm going to say it anyways, as a form of thought designed to make philosophy and my own argument vulnerable, so to speak. The reason that I think I'm wrong is that Laruelle is upheld by thinkers like Alexander Galloway, Ray Brassier, and others as a philosophical materialist, more concerned with substance than possibility. And yet at the same time, after Nietzsche insists on the death of God and doing violence to the ideas of one's teachers, after Barthes insists on the death of the author and the birth of the reader, and after Laruelle himself advocates for non-standard forms of engagement, must we not exactly look for ways to disregard the established interpretations of such thinkers and instead find ways to relate to them speculatively? To engage in this act of using philosophy, or better, using philosophers, is to perform what Eldridge Priest calls absolute ventriloquy. So my misreading is to insist that with a thinker like Laruelle, it's not enough to simply take him at his word one must co-opt his voice with a performative proximity, such as to create a form of non laruellian thought that will, as with his own thought, be more of a performance than a concept. Seen optimistically, this would be to betray the words of the man 
in order to honor the spirit of his thinking, to embrace what he himself calls a principle of insufficiency. Seen otherwise, it would be simply to project noise onto an otherwise homogeneous field of thought. It is to review, refuse the homogeneity of finalized ideas and instead let oneself see the noise. It is to look intently until one begins to see things that aren't there and to then deploy this emergent form of pareidolia to create one's relationship with the thoughts themselves. It is to insist on a conversation even if one is simply looking at a field of blue or a theory of non-philosophy. Decidedly non-standard, insofar as such a gaze makes holes appear where there were none before, um, making an argument vulnerable by insisting on performative proximity, one could probably even say that non-philosophy is first aesthetics. That's because non-philosophy is about collapsing the reflective distance of thought. This requires that at a certain point, non-philosophy isn't really itself anymore. Losing sight of itself, as it has to, in order to become what it is, and in so doing, becoming less of the science La Ruelle claims it to be, and more of a system of exceptions to its own rule. A science of exceptions, even though he doesn't put it quite that way himself. But it does make me wonder whether normal optical rules apply to such a situation, such that the act of losing sight to oneself, and implied as losing oneself into a relationship with something else, also creates that kind of noise particular to visual homogeneity. If so, then, to take, then in order to take this performative imperative seriously, we, we must also consider the possibility that the pareidolic apparitions that appear in excess of the homogeneous conceptual field are the whole point of non-philosophy. And to misread non-philosophy in this way is to constitute errors where there were none, to see noise where there is none, disrupting thought by insisting on the disappearance of thought into the moment of performative proximity. And knowing that I'm almost certainly mistaken in making this argument seems, at the moment, like the only really reasonable reason for saying any of it, to insist that the argument itself remain vulnerable, to insist on the holes in the theory just so I can be absolutely certain it won't float. At the same time, it's worth arguing the opposite. I'm reminded that in Alfred Jarry's Exploits and Opinions of Dr. Faustrel, pataphysician, Dr. Faustrel sets sail around Paris in a sieve, a boat full of holes, which one must imagine requires the constant act of bailing it out just to stay afloat. As a broken vehicle, the sieve is less a transport vessel than a demand for engagement. <laughs> it might not be a lure anymore, since the consequence of non-engagement would be to sink along with the vessel itself, but seen as a site of immersion, something else begins to happen. One attends to the relationship in which one finds oneself, <clears throat> precisely because of the holes that define it. If it didn't have holes, it would just be a boat. With the holes, and the intention to collaborate with the sieve as a vessel, possible imaginary journeys become possible. Thus the second proposition that I'm not going to make is that non-philosophy is about performative engagement with vulnerability which I would propose as at least a working definition of empathy, u empo, an opening to the speculative potential of empathy. The color blue is one of the slower frequencies of light and the slowest of the three primary colors. The consequence of this is that the color blue proceeds more slowly towards us than other colors, and as such, creates a differential pocket in the relative procession of visual encounter. It's a back eddy in photonic space, a hole in the light field, a space perceived by the eye as moving away from us. Like fish swimming upstream or imagining themselves swimming upstream, our imaginations go to the areas of slower photonic current. Whereas the color red tends to advance towards us when we see it, the color blue recedes, pushing the, out, pushing the world outwards a little bit, thus bending light space, and in so doing, making a bit more room for imaginary objects to inhabit. Some critics say that the difference in speed is too minute to be perceived by the eyes. I would counter that even if that's the case, it's definitely not too small to be seen by the imagination. 
The conclusion of the argument that I'm not going to make was going to be the claim that pataphysics is first non-philosophy. The problem is that it seems almost viable to me, which is really unfortunate, because if that's true, then I will have undone all the work of setting up the holes that were there to ensure the insufficiency of the case. I would have inadvertently followed the prescriptions of Dr. Faustrol, who also patched the holes in his sieve, using a particular wax coating to blur the edges with the intention of creating sufficient surface tension that the sieve would remain afloat. It was a disappointing part to the story at first. Fosserl also insisted, though, on a semi-permeability through which he could spit or urinate inside the boat, and the liquid in would indeed fall through the sieve to the other side. Thus, a boat full of holes was made to float without actually removing the holes. The saving grace, I suppose, in my argument, is the status of Faustrel's semi-permeable membrane, a one-way patching of the sieve that requires something like a blind spot to its own illogic, a hole that is not a hole, an imaginary coefficient, like Duchamp's art coefficient, or Jari's imaginary solutions. And my argument was going to be that La Ruelle also relies on a similar constraint for his thinking. He just links his to the quantum relationships between superposition and imaginary numbers which he repeatedly refers to as the square root of minus one. This would be to say that there is already a pataphysical gesture at the root of non-philosophy, or to put it otherwise, pataphysics is first non-philosophy. But as you can see, there isn't really an argument there to be made anymore, which I guess is great because I didn't want to make it, except that the opposite is also true and there is an argument there and we just don't see it. And in some ways, that's its point as well. One could think about it as a blind spot, in the same way as that point in the eye where the optic nerve passes through the retina, where there can be no vision because there is no surface to house the light receptors needed for visual perception. The blind spot is not just a spot, it's more like a hole, a rupture in the field of vision. And this is significant because as Roy Sorensen argues, we tend to understand holes not by focusing on what is missing, but by instead noting what fills it in in this case, vision. The fact is that we don't see holes. Consequently, for the hole in vision, as for other sorts of ruptures, a different logic of understanding is needed. I would suggest that the logic of the blind spot is one of confabulation, defined by neuroscientist Allard Hobson as a way of, quote, patching up the story by filling in the holes. Except the holes never really go away, which is great, since the entire purpose of drawing attention to the blind spot is to insist that part of everything we see is made up, is to reinforce the stakes of speculation by insisting on the vulnerability of vision. We are already living in a world full of holes, which we optically fill with a semi-permeable imagination. Just enough confabulation to make us feel like the story has the capacity to go somewhere else. But in this sense, a blind spot is also a site of speculative potential. The argument is a whole. And the sieve that is our perception of the world is patched with a series of confabulations. Ukon Po, an opening to the speculative possibilities of confabulation, or a hole in its opposite. And indeed, as a posture rather than a proposition, confabulation is not just an aesthetic position, it's also a superposition that is paradoxically undermined by the act of posturing itself. Uspet Po might be thought of thus as a form of pataphysics only slightly reconfigured to emphasize the sieve rather than the boat. The act of imagining the way the holes as a necessary performative error that is the condition of speculative interaction, and the blind spot as an imaginary solution that facilitates the creation of material fictions. It's a form of thinking that exists in the space created by the optical black eddies of the color blue, the apophatic noise of Gansveld thinking, and the speculative ubiquity of broken technological signals. Thus the final proposition that I'm not going to make is that pataphysics, as first non-philosophy, is a space where the stimulation of technical vulnerability becomes a catalyst for relational confabulation. Thank you. Thank you.